Hi, I'm Amy Rodman. I'm a local artist and art teacher, and I have visited the Westmoreland Museum of American Art and noticed which paintings I am most drawn to. And not only that, but I live in the country and I love nature and especially water. Water just has such a calming effect. So I noticed that I was drawn to two paintings in particular that included waterfalls. And I have done a painting that includes a waterfall that I thought would be perfect to use as a tutorial for you. So what I would like you to do is gather up some painting materials. Doesn't matter what you're painting on as far as the surface. I used a canvas board and I had basic colors of paint. You'll see that in the next step of this video. A cup of water, a variety of brushes, and a paper towel, and a placemat for your tabletop. So as we work together, I will show you how to create this three-dimensional effect, how to make the water look like it's actually moving where it falls into the plunge pool. And even though the waterfall is the main focus, it's actually the last thing we'll paint. So. I know that we're not going to finish a painting, a full painting in 30 minutes. So I walk you through each individual step and you'll see it fast forwarded through some of the painting that takes a little longer. And I hope that you either pause and come back to different areas or you just spend some extra time after the video creating yourself. So I hope you enjoy this tutorial and you learn some new techniques. I used acrylic paint. You could use tempera paint if that's what you have at home. And honestly, you could even use watercolor. The only tricky part for that would be the actual waterfall. So you do need a little bit more of a solid paint to paint over top of your base layers. So enjoy. Let's get started with the few things you will need. This is a painting that can be done with just a basic set of colors. So I have that prepared on my palette. I have a variety of brushes. If you're a planner and you do want to sketch things out, you may want to have a pencil. And then this is my sample painting. I'm using a canvas board. They're less expensive than a regular canvas and they're nice because they're really stiff. So they're a little easier to paint on because they're not bouncy like some of the cheaper canvases you can buy or thick paper, the inside of a cereal box, anything you have at home. It doesn't hurt to paint on any other surface. It's just fun to paint. So get your stuff out and do it. Okay, so as I said, I really enjoy water. I like nature and this was just a subject that I found interesting and so I painted it and I'm going to walk you through the steps of how to do it and the first thing is looking at the main shapes so these rock ledges that the water is falling over we're going to pretend like if you were taking a hike you could be up on top of here and there's trails with woods perhaps and then there's this rock ledge that the water is streaming down into the plunge pool, it's called. And then there's some extra rocks over here that maybe if you were down at the bottom, you'd be able to crawl across or walk across and actually go back behind the waterfall. So we need to give it a 3D effect. If I were to plan this out, I need to start off with slanted lines that are going to bring me to the surface that the water is falling over top. The other line that I need is where I want the plunge pool to start. I'm going to make that less even um, and the rocks are going to appear in this area and then right about here and here is where we'll see those rock ledges. You don't really need to sketch anything there. I'll show you how to paint that in so it gives it that dark shadow. And then even though the waterfall is really the focus, the focal point of the painting, it is going to be the very last thing that we paint. It is the, the last step to everything else. So as important as this is, we have to have a good foundation of all of these other background images. All right, I am going to start with the sky because that is behind everything else. And I'm going to use a pretty big flat brush to fill this entire area in. You can use whatever colors you want. If it's a bright blue sky, it's a sunny day, you can start with that. If it's a sunset and you 
want other colors, you can add those to your palette. But I'm going to actually mix the colors directly on my canvas. So I started with the blue and now I'm tapping into the white here and I will just brighten it up. And if I get over my lines where the rocks are a little bit, that's okay because those are darker and acrylic paint dries quickly. So as I'm mixing, I want it to happen fairly quickly so that it doesn't start drying on me. And I want it to go across in a horizontal manner so that it can look like one of those real calm days. My other one had some clouds. If you want to add clouds, you would use a dabbing motion. But for this one, I'm going to go with a calm, bright blue sky. That's one of the things that I love about painting is we can all do similar techniques with different colors. And if I'm painting something for a second time, I'm not going to want to do it exactly the same. Another thing that I do is I lift up my canvas and I do roll that paint over to the edge because if it doesn't end up in a frame, then it still looks finished enough. I could lean it against a shelf or display it and there's not those messy edges. So right now it's extremely even. I'm going to put a little bit of a streakiness into it with the white and finish this up fairly quickly and then move into those rock ledges. So there's the sky. And one thing to keep in mind with acrylic paint is if you are not using the same brush for the next stage, which I am because it's another big area and I really like this flat brush, but if you are not, you're going to want to rinse it out or soak it in between colors. Don't just let it sit here or it'll dry up and be very hard to wash out. All right, I've rinsed out my brush and I am going to start with the part that goes, falls behind the waterfall. It's going to be very dark and it's important that you still paint that because the water is not 100% solid. So you're going to see that color through. So when I start this, I'm going to begin by finding the area that the water is going to fall over. And then I am going to fill this entire center area with the black paint. Now I am no Bob Ross and I'm sure none of you are either. So I cannot finish a painting in a half an hour. So what I'm going to do instead is give you little snippets of instruction and then fast forward through the stages of what I'm painting. And that way you can follow along from start to finish. But I will make sure that I explain what colors I'm using and different techniques throughout. As I move into the sides, I want them to look like they're going back into the painting that we want to give this some depth. So it looks like it is 3D, not just completely flat. So again, I'm starting with the black and I am painting that line that I had originally drawn. But this time, instead of leaving it completely black, I'm going to begin mixing my own colors. And if you have gray, you can use them, but we can use a very limited palette and still achieve this. So I'm going to begin mixing some white into the black and using my brush in a more choppy type of manner, going back and forth, and then also dipping between the different colors. I'm going to fill this area in at an angle. I did flip my painting upside down and that's because since I am dominant with my right hand, it's harder for me to reach and paint at that other angle. So if you need to switch the direction that you are painting in, if it's going to work better, do it. It is not going to affect how your painting comes out just because you're painting sideways or upside down. However, I know it's kind of distracting on the video. So I will try to do this less throughout the rest of the series of it. But for this base coat, it just made sense to switch it up to be upside down. The last base color I need is 
this plunge pool where I'm going to mix the green and the blue. I'll worry about the ripples and the other effects later. For now, I'm just getting that main color started. So again, same brush, dipping into the green and the blue and just mixing it on my palette or on my painting. You can mix on your palette if you prefer. But for the base color, I'm going to go with this. I am putting a little bit of black over here to begin with. So it will be darker and look a little deeper. And then all those details will happen on top of this. My entire canvas is covered with a base coat. And now what I'm doing is I am no longer going to need such a large brush, but I'm picking a brush that feels rather stiff. And I'm going to be doing something called dry brushing my painting with some additional colors. And when I do this, I'm barely dipping the tip of my paintbrush into the paint. And then I even dab off some of that extra so that when I am applying the paint, I am able to kind of just skim the top surface. Now this brown is a bit brighter than I was hoping. So I am going to kind of work it into the canvas a little bit so it mixes with that gray. And I'm going to remix and make a new color that I'm a little happier with, just a little more muted. Again, dab off all the extra. And what I'm trying to do here is make it look like the rocks are layered. So I want to bring in some new color. I want to make some areas look highlighted and some look like they are stacked on top of each other and you see shadows where it's kind of deeper into a crevice. But I'm not covering what I already did completely. I'm trying to enhance that instead. So let me show you the other one where you see quite a bit of brown, some brighter whites or light grays, and then some deeper, darker crevices here and there. To create the rocks over across the bottom here, I'm going to be giving them some big random shapes and then coming back and giving some highlights and shadows to create a more three dimensional rock. So at first, they are going to look pretty flat and a little too bright, but eventually with an extra layer on top they will have some more dimension and look like they are rocks you could actually step across In order to give these rocks a three-dimensional look, I did mix a little bit of white and black into the brown for different areas. However, I'm still not happy with this brown. I like the warm tone to it, but it's just not quite right. So if you are working with something and it's just not exactly what you want, there is no reason why you shouldn't go in and change it partway through. So what I did is I found a different tan. I'm going to mix some lighter and darker versions of it to layer over top and dry brush some extra accent colors 
over top of these rocks just because I think it needs to be neutralized just a little bit. It was just not the, the shade that I was expecting. After I'm done with this, I'm going to move into the greenery. So at the top, I want it to look like there's plenty of trees growing and even some shrubbery and moss throughout the rocky area. Last but not least, on these rocks, I want some of these ledges to just really stand out. So that means that I need to increase my light and dark areas. So I'm coming in here and I don't want it to look like I'm making a pattern of stripes, but I do want to just create some darker crevices, some different areas, some that are shorter or longer than others. And that's going to increase contrast. Contrast is where things look very different from each other. So the light against the dark will bring out these details. The greenery is going to be a dabbed texture where I dab my paintbrush up and down to create the illusion that there's a bunch of leaves there. And in the process of doing this, I'll start with my medium green, but then I'm going to add in some darks and lights. And those lights are going to be used with yellow paint rather than white to look like the sun is hitting it and giving it that real nice bright green look. If you tend to use the white versus the yellow, you get more of a minty color. So it's not exactly the effect that I would want. So I'm going to create several layers of this so it fully covers. And as I progress, I will begin mixing and dabbing in those other colors. I'm also allowing it to come down over the ledge and basically mask that really straight line so it has a very natural look of a tree line. If you want pine trees in it, of course, that would be a little more controlled where they'll look like triangles, but you have to be careful that they're not too perfect. Going back into the water, I am going to create a bit of a rippled effect. And so I'm going to start mixing some colors so it's darker over here and over here I want it to look a little more shallow and add actually brown into that blue and green. I want it to have a more natural effect. And by adding white, it's a bit too bright usually. So I'm going to create a rippled effect by moving my brush without creating, you know, like a big wave pattern. The big wave is not going to 
achieve what I want here. So I have that dark base already. And now I'm just going back and forth between the different colors to kind of blend it all and make it look a little more shallow in some spots and a little deeper in others. And that all happens with the, the color that you're creating, whether it's darker or lighter. And I also don't want it to be too bright. So this blue does look a little too bright. So that's whenever I dip into the green and start mixing while I'm working in this wet section. We are at the last step of this, which is the most important part, and that is the actual waterfall. So when I do this, I'm going back to that dry brush technique. I want barely any paint on my brush so that it will skim across the top and show the darkness kind of peeking through that rushing water. Then at the bottom, I want this splash to look very foamy and, you know, coming up high and real soft looking. I don't want real bright white or real harsh marks. And then last but not least, right underneath it, I want a little bit of a highlight of that ripple that is created by the force of the water right in front of that in the plunge pool. Of course, you can always go back and add touch-ups and extra details once you truly look at it, but this is going to be the last step before I decide if there's any last minute things that I want to add to other parts of it. Overall, I'm pretty happy with my result, but my water's still a little wet, so you'll notice that the blue carried into the white. Minutes to dry. In the meantime, I think I might brighten up a few little places so it looks like the sunlight is hitting my green leaves a little bit more so that it just looks like a brighter, sunny day. And, you know, just double check what and look at it from far away. So what I mean by that is I will roll my chair back or hold it up at an arm's length and see it from a different perspective. When I'm painting and I'm only a foot and a half, two feet away from my tabletop, it looks very different than if you see it from across the room or from a small distance where most artists or most viewers are viewing your artwork. So I hope you give this a try and use it things, change some colors, add any other little details that you wish. Notice that some of the water is a little heavier in places and a little lighter in others. So it looks like it's flowing and it's not just a steady stream of like a wall of water. And, you know, rocks can be different shapes. Nothing has to be exactly like what I've done, but I hope that you give painting a try and, you know, use some of the paintings at the Westmoreland as a as inspiration. You know, what types of things do you, are you drawn to? I'm always drawn to water. So this was a perfect fit.
Hi guys, it's Michael again. And this month I found this cute idea. Um, I thought it might be a nice uh, memento um, for the upcoming holiday. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but it's a handprint that just uses some paint and some, some Q-tips kind of like uh, skeleton bones. Um, so I thought maybe this is something that you uh, might make for an in-law or something that you can't get together with uh, as you normally might. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you just quickly how you might think about doing this. And of course, there's always other ways of doing things. Um, but I, I started um, with a black piece of cardstock um, you could use any colored cardstock if you were using white paint. I used white acrylic paint. I watered it down a little bit. I uh, put some water in it and made it a little bit more runny than acrylic paint normally is. And um, then I had Q-tips. So the way I started it is I took my cardstock. I'm going to use purple this time. And I just put my hand on here. And I sort of lightly traced it in pencil. So this would be an optional step, but in preparation for what I was going to do, I thought that this was a good idea. It's probably hard for you to see, but it's just a light pencil line. Um, and the reason why I did the tracing was so that I could take my Q-tips then and kind of lay them out where I want them to be. So for instance, then I just cut some pieces that I would start to lay in like this. Um, maybe you have to cut some sections out. Obviously, my hand is quite large. Um, some, some little folks are going to have some smaller hands, so you're going to have to do more trimming. And you, you know, you could do something more decorative too with the Q-tips. I kind of just laid them out like I thought bones would kind of look in the in the hand obviously it's not all of them but you could do more you could do something more decorative with the pieces as well so that's what i did i just kind of trimmed them up just from regular old q-tips from the bathroom so once i had them laid out and i knew where i wanted them to go um, then came the messy part so kind of laid them like that. And the next step, like I said, is the messy part. So what I did was I kind of just pulled these aside. I got the extra Q-tips out of the way and kind of like laid them, laid them out how I had them. Now, if you did this in real time, um, you would go wash your hand after this step. I kind of just pulled them apart so I kind of knew where they were going to go. Um, and then I took the paint and I'm just going to put some paint here all over my hand. Um, and you could experiment with this part first to see how much paint you want to use or, or not use. Um, like maybe the first one isn't going to be great. It has to be pretty, pretty wet. And then I just roughly placed it and put some pressure on it and made a handprint like that. So, like I said, I'll probably go wash my hand now, but to save time, I'm just going to work with this dirty hand. Um, so the next step was that I just took the pieces as I had them laid out and kind of dunk them in the paint, smear them around in the paint. And so it's going to get a nice coat of acrylic white paint on it. So if the Q-tips are not quite white, they're actually probably more of an ivory color. So I wanted them to be white. And then the paint actually just works as a glue and it's going to stick them right on there. So again, and I'm just laying them out exactly where I had them. Um, and since my hand is sticky, you'll note that I'm picking up the Q-tips just by pressing on them. So that's one benefit of having a sticky hand to pick up little Q-tip bits. However, some people may not like to have their hand dirty when they're doing this. So 
So there you have it. And basically, that's what I did. I just laid them out exactly where I had them. You can take, like these were the Q-tips that I had across the center of the hand. So that doesn't matter. I can just dunk all these in here four at a time. It didn't really matter where they're gonna go. Make sure they get nice paint on them so that you have like at least one little blob of paint on each end of the Q-tip. So it's gonna stick. There you go. Now where's my thumb pieces? These are my thumb pieces, just throw them in the paint. Get a nice goop of paint on there. There you go. And then the last two I used for the wrist. So and let those sort of run off the page. If my hand wasn't so floppy, I would also not have these little blobs of paint, but there you go. That is it. And then let that dry and those should stick right on the paper. So I hope you enjoy this and I hope it's fun for you if you try it and I will see you next time. I'm going to go wash my hand now. Thank you. My name's Dara and today I'm going to take you shopping with me at the Westmoreland shop. I got my mask, 
and we are ready to go. Come on. Here at the Westmoreland Museum shop, we're open for safe and socially distanced shopping. Let's go. First, we're gonna get nice and clean. When you enter the shop, we have hand sanitizer and gloves available so all of our guests can feel safe and sanitized. We also ask that you wear a mask while indoors, but really, they're the hottest fashion trend right now. You might even find some accessories to match while you're here. We also have social distancing guidelines and reminders to stay six feet apart while you're in the store. Just a little farther back now. Don't forget to touch with your eyes. You'll be greeted by a friendly shop associate wearing a mask just like you and safely ringing up your sale behind a plexiglass barrier. Hey, that's me. And quarantine isn't just for people. Whenever you try in a piece but decide not to buy it, we put it in a designated place off the shelves to be disinfected before returning to the floor. Now that you're all briefed on the rules, let's get to the fun part, shopping. We have a beautiful selection of handmade products in the shop. This is my favorite time of year because it's fall and you know what that means. It's time for pumpkins, cozy accessories, and beautiful autumn decor. Every year we get in these gorgeous glass pumpkins. Do you collect pumpkins? I collect pumpkins. And I definitely have my eyes on a few of these. These glass pumpkins are all hand-blown by artist Tate Newfield. Tate splits his time between Hawaii and Pennsylvania and is a sculptor and glass blower. These pumpkins are beautiful and come in so many different colors and sizes. I'm really partial to this black one. And just like real pumpkins, no two are the same, so if you have your eye on one, you definitely need to add it to your collection today. Next on the list of fall must-haves are these scarves from Laverne Kemp. Laverne is a fiber artist from Pittsburgh and works in so many different wearable woven arts. These scarves are so versatile and come in so many sizes and colors. I can imagine getting all cozy in one of these and taking a walk in a pumpkin patch. And finally, we have these super unique pieces by Margaret Dorfman. Her process is so interesting. She dehydrates and forms fruits and vegetables into paper-like sheets and creates jewelry, glassware, and even bowls out of them. She uses beets, lemons, papaya, peppers, and so many other natural materials. That orange bowl actually even smells like oranges. It's so nice. Phew, I'd say that is what you call a successful shopping day. We got all of our fall decor and we were safe while we were doing it. I know I got myself a bag of goodies and I hope that you do too soon. The Westmoreland Museum shop is open every day that the museum is, which is Wednesday through Sunday from 10 to five. I'm gonna leave all of the information on the screen so you know exactly when you should come visit us. We hope to see you soon. Have a great night and thanks so much. Bye.